This podcast is part of the Big Heads Media Podcast Network. Go to BigHeadsMedia.com for more great podcasts. Guten Tag und willkommen zu Episode 48 von Kochen mit Trauer. Ich bin dein Moderator Chris und hier ist dein anderer Moderator Chris. Wie geht's? Ja, nicht schlecht. Uh, wie geht es dir? Ja, ich bin gut, ja. <lacht> Um, that, that's all my German. Uh, hello, welcome to episode 48. That was a recycled joke from when we did it in French way back when. <laughs> I mean, we've already done the pleasantries, so... <laughs> yeah, with some amounts of uh, preparation, it sounded yeah. like. Yeah, well, I uh, actually, I did learn because, I, you know, I put it into Google Translate. Here's a, here's a tip for you all. When you put something into Google Translate, always just double check what words mean, what you think they mean because obviously i put in um i'm your host and this is your host i can't remember what the word i think it was like gast gerber for like a pa parasite host well i don't know if it was a parasite host i think it but yeah it was more like a host like you know someone's hosting you in their home type thing so check apparently moderator is um or moderator is like a tv presenter or whatever which seemed closer Yeah, seems more appropriate. Better than, say, like a podcast furor. <laughs> yes, definitely. So anyway, uh, here's how the podcast works. For those of us who are new, it's usually not in German. And basically what we do is we've each got two interesting and random topics that we think you'll find interesting. And hopefully we'll all learn something new as we go on this journey together. And so without further ado, over to you, Chris, for your first topic. Okay, so Chris, as you well know, when we sit down to record an episode of this esteemed show, we text our respective assistants to fulfil our riders, the things we absolutely need to be at our wittiest, our most creative, our most eloquent. Uh, for me, it's it's two kilos of cooked chicken titties, a kilo of spinach and six cups of rice, a full body massage, a painting of a noble horse, a flautist playing a medley of Chumbawamba hits, uh, a parrot, preferably named Nibbles, who's learned to squawk the poems of E.E. E. Cummings, and a dartboard emblazoned with a face of our podcasting nemesis joe rogan uh so far so standard my question for you is what's on your rider just a cup of tea really oh okay great oh, well, <laughs> <laughs> do you have milk with that oh yeah yeah milk no sugar <laughs> milk no sugar okay <laughs> don't be extravagant okay i feel like the diva in this uh, sort of relationship um but so my topic is about celebrity riders the things that musicians and performers demand they have waiting for them backstage before they can go on to delight and amuse their legions of fans uh now does the phrase green m&ms mean anything to you green m&ms yeah uh well i mean i can imagine but nothing specific beyond like <laughs> no no connotations beyond the Very specific imagery of green M&Ms. So it's sort of become a byword for an overly demanding diva, someone whose tastes are so uh, particular and grip on reality so loose by the cannibal of fame that they demand a bowl of M&Ms with the green ones removed. But uh, okay. it does have a real history because Van Halen did have, a, as a rider in their contract, a bowl of M&Ms with all the brown ones removed in order to know at a glance if the promoter had read the contract and followed it to the letter. So it's it wasn't necessarily mm. a you know they had no intention of saying we refuse to perform if there was a single brown M and M anywhere near it, but because the stage show was so dangerous that they had to be sure the band or the stage crew weren't being put in danger, they needed to make sure mm. that the contract was being fulfilled to very very specific requirements. They'd once had a stage collapse because a promoter hadn't read their specific technical instructions. And, uh, like, they've got heavy lights over them. They've got fire being shot out of cannons. They've got all these sort of really dangerous and technical aspects of, of a, of a live rock show. And because the, they had a stage collapse and, you know, lights fell on them and, you know, they just didn't want people getting hurt. So they put that in the rider to know that the, um, the contracts had been read thoroughly. I mean, that makes sense. And I guess that's where it all stems from. But then some of them do see, I think, like, really overly diva-ish. It's like, I think it's Mariah Carey who demands that their dressing room is painted white. I just have to decorate them. I mean, what happens if you've got, like, two two acts, One, you know, one day, you know, one night Mariah Carey, one night it's... Megadeth. I don't know, 
Yeah, I was going to say Alice Cooper, but yeah, Megadeth or something. <laughs> yeah. It's like one's demanding the room's white and the next day you got to paint it black. And it's like, oh, for fuck's sake. I oh, know, that'll be for the Rolling Stones then, I guess. Rolling Stones. <laughs> <laughs> yeah, I mean, so, some of them, I, I think, like, even if the, the origin of this is like, it had a genuine point. Yeah, t- today it seems like, so I was looking up a few, um, you know, the different ones. It, Mariah Carey, as you mentioned, it famously, it's something like 16 bottles of this particular brand of water, loads of flowers, but only a certain amount of flowers. And you just think, oh, come on, just... I mean, the weird thing is they pay for all of this stuff. It's not like the venue has to pay for all the stuff, because it, it, it gets... Oh, that's what I was going to ask you. Does it come out of the artists? Yeah, yeah, well, it, it gets it, it oh. gets charged to them. It's... It's meant to be like just, you know, if his stuff's there and then, they don't need to send someone out to get it. So like, I don't know, if there's like, you get there and do, you know, your, your rehearsal and your, your stage, uh, your sound check and stuff. And then you probably not got time to go out for a full meal, but if they can get pizza delivered in between rehearsal mm. and the show, it, it's, it just sends you, it saves you sending someone out. But now it's to the point where, you know, there's, there's royal protocol as well. So like, if a queen, the queen ever does an event, like you said, all the you know the dressing rooms and stuff are always repainted, which does make you think that she's constantly surrounded by the smell of fresh paint in quite s- s- closed rooms. <laughs> it's that joke, isn't it? The queen must just assume that everywhere smells of paint. <laughs> like she must just think that's the way the world smells. <laughs> yeah. Read about there's all these weird protocols when it's like meeting the queen and stuff. Like, don't get your cock out. Well, that too. You know, you're like not supposed to walk in front of her or something. And then it's like, if you're at a dinner party with her, she has to talk to the person. I think it's the person to her right first, and then she'll talk to the person to her left and stuff. And it's just like, who comes up with all this shit? Yeah. And and do the royals actually care? Or, uh, well, you know. they probably do, because it's the only thing they like. It's, yeah. <laughs> it's the only thing that keeps it between them and us. Otherwise, we'd all just realize they're just normal people. Yeah. got rich because their ancestors <laughs> killed the right pe- like the right person. I think you mean they're anointed by God and cho- <laughs> yeah. chosen by an almighty being to rule over us. But yeah, that too. Yeah. Yeah, not just an old lady in an expensive hat. So when we inevitably take Cooking with Grief live on the road, you know, massive to- you know, mm-hmm. to- you know, a-, a massive tour bus each so we're not in each other's space mm-hmm. and and playing, you know, the MEN Arena and Madison Square Gardens. Um, yeah. What what are we gonna have on our ludicrous rider that will inevitably yeah. bankrupt us? Yeah, I was gonna say since it's coming out of our budget, uh, <laughs> just a cup of tea. Yeah, like, yeah like, do you know how much pizza costs? <laughs> yeah, it's a rip off. I made sandwiches, Chris. <laughs> that's fine. <laughs> Ooh, ham. <laughs> See, that's that's the thing is I don't know how how ludicrously out of touch you have to be to start not only like asking for that but like. Getting angry that it's not there. Yeah, you, you know, I like like, like if I turned up and they put on like you know they'd done like sandwiches and stuff like that and got drinks, you'd be so grateful, like oh nice, oh Quavers, yeah. nice one, oh so, thanks so much. Yeah, I'd just be happy that there was like yeah, yeah like, like say, an, anything, just like a bit of a spread, maybe some cake. I'm just like oh nice, yeah. I'm and just if, very easily yeah. pleased, I guess. Yeah, and if not, you'd be like all right, well there's a spa down the road. I'll just nip out and get a <laughs> Scotch egg. It's fine. There's some band, and I cannot remember who, which band it's, which band it is, uh, but they're like rider include to see if anybody's read it. They just included really ridiculous things like being able to put all the like air conditioning units into like one giant contraption so that they can ride it around <laughs> like a, like a hovercraft or what, something. Wasn't it the Foo Fighters? They put in ludicrous runs just to see what they could get away with. Well, it might have been. Yeah. I don't know if it was them specifically, but I, in researching this, then I know that they, they did, you know, they just see what they could get away with. Like, you wonder, you know, like, all the all these bands, no matter how big they are, like, you know, when they inevitably say they're bankrupt because, you know, physical music sales dropped off. And then you mm. learn things like, like, like you too apparently complaining that, you know, they were losing money from not selling CDs anymore. But then mm. Bono had, like, lost his, his favourite hat and managed to get another one, but flew it over in a private jet for the next show. And you think, <laughs> just wear a different hat or no hat. Yep. Or get it sent yeah. in, the, in the post, you know. It's like, and yeah. um, I can't, I can't, again, I can't remember what band it was, but they really wanted a curry, but only ones from us at one particular place. And they got the curry flown over on a private jet. And you think, you're idiots. No, it's definitely going to be cold. 
<laughs> yeah, that's true. I mean, it's bad enough when you have to wait for like when your delivery takes over an hour, and you're like, "Oh, for fuck's sake!" Like, yeah, yeah I better go heat it up in the oven. Yeah, imagine it taking like a six-hour, like six-hour transatlantic flight or something. You'd be like, <laughs> yeah, it gets that you have one bite, and you go, "Oh, it's cold." Bin. <laughs> <laughs> Rubbish. Yeah, I know. Obviously, like at the lower end of the music industry, like it is like a grind and stuff to try and get. You know, get noticed and get sales and stuff. Yeah. But, like, I think the reason I've always preferred the film industry to the music industry is because, like, the music industry, like you say, have always got this sort of, like, I don't know if pretensions it, but, you know, it's always, like, based on sales and stuff, and they always talk about it, doing it for the art, but then also secretly really doing it for the money. Bono in his hat, whatever. Whereas at least the film industry have always, like, openly just about, like, gross profit is literally the only thing they care about. And they're, like... You know, it's like, you're, you're bastards, but at least you're openly bastards, so they can't help but respect that. It's like, you know, they never pretend it's for the art, it's always just box office gross. That's all we care about. How much money is in my bank account? <laughs> you know, it's like, if you're open about it, yeah, fair enough. Just don't pretend you're doing it for the art, when really it's all about the money. Yeah, we can stomach sort of shameless greed. Yeah. If you're just honest about it. Yeah, exactly. Speaking of which, <laughs> message oh, from Patreon. our sponsors. <laughs> <laughs> uh, we don't even have any sponsors. <laughs> maybe um, we're too shameless. <laughs> yeah, maybe. Yeah, there's definitely a fine line between humility and and shame. So that's the end of my first topic, Chris. What's your first one? Ask you a question, which for once you didn't ask. Oh, actually, you did that to me. Yeah, Never mind. <laughs> uh, <laughs> uh, but anyway, I ask you a question. We both like bookstores. Mm. Books and stuff. What feelings, you know, when you walk into a bookshop like Waterstones or who aren't sponsoring us or wherever, what feelings do you get? Like what? Well, because there is something about walking into bookshops, isn't there? That's just nicer than buying it online and stuff. Yeah, I mean, it's it's the smell, it's the ambiance, it's it's the fact they're always super quiet. You could be in a really bustling uh, like shopping centre, like you know the Arndale, but then you you you, you step in and it's suddenly immediately super quiet. mm Hmm. It's just it's just a joyful place to be. Does it ever make you need a poo? Um, I can't say specifically that. There, there may be coincidental times when I've been trying to cram in too many jobs to do, uh, and you know, buying <laughs> books is the last on them. But no, I'd I'd uh, I like to browse, so I probably wouldn't I wouldn't linger. Oh. Well, then you haven't suffered from um, Mariko Aoki phenomenon. Which is a Japanese expression referring to the urge to defecate suddenly felt after entering a bookstore. Out of protest or out of a feeling of relaxing? Well, yeah, nobody's entirely sure why. It's kind of specifically Japanese phenomenon, but like if you actually ask around and stuff, you'll find that people in other countries and stuff, if you look online, like it is an international thing, it's just the only the Japanese apparently felt comfortable enough to discuss you know, <laughs> discuss it with people. Whereas everyone else keeps it to themselves unless it's like an anonymous Reddit like subreddit or something. Aoki Mariko Gensho is a so the name comes from a article in nineteen eighty five. That was the author of the article that first like discussed it. And then everyone, <laughs> just, just imagine that, you're right, she probably wrote <laughs> thousands of articles and the name got attached to the uh, needing a poo in a bookshop <laughs> like, phenomenon. So yeah, so basically, nobody knows entirely why. Theories include, like like you said, bookshops are just inherently very relaxing places. Mm-hmm. So there's a feeling of being able to relax. There's the, um, might be like a sort of Pavlovian response, you know, because People like to read books when they're having a poo. You know, sat in the toilet reading the book. I remember our English teacher told us to how much time we were wasting that we like on the toilet each day that we could spend reading books. <laughs> yeah. Whether or not the smell of paper and ink might have a laxative effect, but it specifically relates to bookshop. Bookshops, not other shops. Or, or not like the actual process of reading itself. Like, because I like no, to, no, I like just... to read in bed, but I I I'd not had that feeling of re- relaxation. It seems to be specifically bookshops rather than just sitting around reading. So like I say the article was in 1985 that where it became, you know, widely known. But there had been mentions as far back as the 50s about you know where people had mentioned a similar thing. 
you know, need going into bookshops and needing to poo. And so then it blew up after this person wrote it, and then it, you know they got all magazine got loads of letters and stuff saying, "Oh yeah, I feel the same." Is it is it something you've experienced yourself? Uh no, I can't say. Can't say I have. Like I said, I quite like um, bookshops, but it's not. Um... <laughs> is that why it's called Waterstones? <laughs> Yeah, no, their the, the jingle is just bloop. I was going to say, though, just going back to sort of bookshops being, you know, relaxing and different. I like bookshops that, like, they need to feel kind of like creaky floors and stuff like that make a good bookshop. Do you know what I mean? Like, mm. you know, you're saying about stepping out in a way, like the uh, Deansgate Waterstones, which for any listeners who aren't from Manchester, it's like a massive multi story bookshop. On, in the centre of Manchester. I'm sure I saw somewhere that it's the, one of the biggest in the country, I think. But it's all old and creaky, and you know, the, you know, and the, the staircases and stuff. That's the feel you want, isn't it? Yeah, so, so, uh, same one in Leeds. Like, it's, you know, a, a modern, you know, glass fronted building on a row of modern shops, but it's. It's a little bit dimmer. It's it feel it's got that sort of you know sort of slightly partially subterranean feel of a of a second hand bookshop that you might just stumble across. Yeah, I know what you mean. Yeah, there's there's definitely aesthetics. Whereas the one in the Arndale Centre is too bright and modern. Hmm. This is yeah, this, exactly. this is very north of England centric. <laughs> but, yeah. <laughs> but, yeah but, no, but I'm just saying in general, like yeah, you don't want bookstores you know, to be that, like the Apple Store. Yeah, exactly. Like a sleek modern bookshop obviously in terms of like actually being able to sell books to you would be perfectly acceptable if it was like the apple store i mean obviously the apple store only has like one of each phone in it or spread out which you know <laughs> bookshop with like 12 books on its display <laughs> yeah. would be pretty shitty but you know what i mean like if it was all brightly lit and everything that would obviously be perfectly fine but it just wouldn't feel right would it so there is definitely something about the site like bookshops inherently not inherently but often have like a different sort of psychological impact on you compared to other shops yeah definitely you yeah. Know, which kind of explains why again nobody knows why it makes you need the poo but why you wouldn't necessarily feel it in a supermarket but if you went to a bookshop next door you would hmm yeah that's a good point are there any other kind of stores that feel different because i know some clothes shops deliberately try and employ it you know like the ones where they've like got the lights turned down and the music turned up or whatever mm. um to try and make it feel i don't know what they're going for but like they deliberately try and employ that tactic don't they like is it hollisters i think where like it's just dim and yeah as, yeah. as close as a as a to, as to like a nightclub as a clothes shop can mm. get other than that like I said, oh, well, and obviously Apple stores deliberately go the opposite way because they're like high-tech, minimalist, yeah, bright lights. Like you can always... T- but I don't know if any other technology shops have tried to, you know, like emulate that, have they? You know, like PC World or whatever is always the same as it ever was. Stuff like that. I don't know if anyone's... Actually, no, I'm saying that. Samsung shops and stuff are the same, yeah. So actually, yeah, like technology shops, like Samsung and Apple and stuff, they definitely go for a... A specific vibe, like the body shop, and what's the the sort of ethical one where everyone gets the candles and bath bombs from Lush? Oh, Lush! Like you can smell that from like a mile away, and you just affront it mm. with the you know sort of mix of of everything. I don't know that that's necessarily what they're going for, but I do find them to be quite. Uh, I don't know they're quite sparsely populated, but it's all too much. Well, I feel like Lush knows what they're doing because they know that you can smell a Lush. Ten yeah. miles before you can see it, so. yeah. and it's a great it's word. Like free as advertising. Well. Oh, that's lush. lush. Oh, you went southern yeah. with it. You went sort of Essex. Oh, it's lush. <laughs> it wouldn't work in the Brummie accent. It's lush. That is. Oh, it's absolutely <laughs> lush. <laughs> I really like bookshops. Really don't like libraries. Weird. I always feel kind of a. I feel like. You, like I feel like mm, too quiet. You know, you were saying about bookshops. Yeah, bookshops have that nice quiet. Whereas libraries have that sort of oppressive silence. Yeah. Like, I go into a bookshop and I enjoy the quiet and I'm kind of like, you talk a little bit quieter and you you, know, you sort of, there's that nice little, there's a little bit of noise, but not too much. It's sort of like people walking around. Whereas 
libraries, like you feel, well, I feel like the urge to shout because I feel like they <laughs> I feel like I'm being closed in by the silence. Yeah, I know what you mean. I, I don't know. Like there are definitely like good libraries. Like I, I, I always found at uni, like there are, you know, there were a few different libraries at Leeds, and there were a few different ones, and it, it, like you say, it felt oppressive. And then other ones that were a bit cosier, you know. Yeah, no, I I couldn't do any work in libraries. I've spent very little time in the libraries at university. It's like I did my entire like dissertation from my bedroom because I was just like, it's like go to the library. It's quiet. It's like no, no, it's too quiet. I need to just sit somewhere cozy with yeah. distractions because I have an attention span of about thirty <laughs> seconds. Yeah, and it's you can't make a brew every fifteen minutes in a library. So, mm. but yeah, that's me done. Okay. So I will hand it over to you for your second topic. Okay, so for my second topic, uh, we might have, I might have asked you this before actually, but Chris, what do you want to happen to your body after your clogs have been fatally popped? Well, this kind of shows me my sort of, um, not split personality, but like, I tend to bounce around between two extremes when it comes to decisions rather than being somewhere in the middle. So I either don't care what happens to me, like throw me in a ditch or you know, donate to science or anything. Because I'm like, I'm dead. Like, yeah. what What does it matter? Yeah. Or I want a grandiose tomb, like a pyramid or something. Like, like an actual mausoleum that will, that will last for a thousand years with a statue. Either worm food or Stalin levels. Yeah. Of, yeah. Yeah. No, I'm the same way. Like, sometimes I think, oh, just fucking put me in the bin. Who cares? Strip me for parts if you can use anything. Good fucking luck. And then sometimes I like, no, uh, giant Greek pyre. You know, preferably with, you know, mourners and, you know, the whole shebang. Would you like to be turned into shoes? No. Specifically, I think I... Uh, like, your skin flayed and turned into human leather? Uh, again, no. No? Okay. Uh, no, I'm not, I'm not feeling it. Wh- wh- why? Is that now an option? Uh, no, but it was, it was the exact fate of a 19th century bandit and highwayman called George Parrott. He was, uh, interestingly, he was also known as Big Nose George or Big Beak Parrot because his I... surname was Parrot and he had a big nose. That was, that was the level of, <laughs> of, that was of uh, that, yeah, that was enough. He was found guilty of the murder of two lawmen and, uh, Parrot was sentenced to be hanged to death, but was killed by mob violence two days before the date of his execution, which is like, <laughs> if you're, say, the families of the yeah. lawmen, Justice has been served. He's about to be hanged. You don't have to break into jail and beat him to death. <laughs> like, <laughs> what, How is that not enough? But the doctor who performed his autopsy, a man called John Osborne, decided for some reason to have parrot skin flayed off and made into a pair of shoes. What type of shoes? Leather. <laughs> loafers? Like a nice uh, 19th century Chelsea boot. No, yeah, they're, they're like, uh, yeah, m- not loafers, they're more like... um. They look a bit like spat. Is it spats? Is that the right word? Oh yeah. You yeah. know, like the sort of tipped, wing-tipped sort of. Uh, yeah. But just that sentence alone, like he it, it decided on a whim to have a man turn into a pair of shoes, like oh, to be a wacky doctor in the olden days. <laughs> I, I swear, like in the Wild West, you could just move to another town, declare yourself the doctor. They say, okay, you're now the town's doctor. Do what you want. We well, could. Yeah. I like mean, who is going to like? Who is going to check? Yeah, you you say you're a doctor. It's good enough for me. Yeah, the doctor John Osborne later got elected to governor of um, uh, Wyoming, I think it was, and decided to wear his human skin shoes to his inauguration ceremony. As you do, as you do, you know, but keep them for best. I mean, that's weird enough in itself, but it turned out later that uh, Osborne's assistant, a 15-year-old girl called Lillian Heath, uh, kept Parrot's skull and used it throughout her life variously as an ashtray, a pen holder, and a doorstop. Both the skull and the shoes are now on display in a county museum in Wyoming. I guess there just weren't, like, strict rules about that sort of thing. Like, first of all, why are you employing a 15-year-old to be your autopsy assistant? Uh but to be fair, in them days, that's probably the equivalent of being like forty-five. Oh yeah, true. A late bloomer. Yeah, she probably only had a couple more years before dying at the ripe old age of died in childbirth. <laughs> like, yeah, yeah, true. It's when yeah. people romanticize like old timey things. It's like, oh, when things were simpler. It's like people died like really young a lot. Yeah, it's sort of like well, kids don't. Have, you know, people don't have many kids these days. It's like yeah, because they survived childbirth. It's not yeah. risky, you know, but like, 
I mean, you're 12 now, so I don't know if you've got another one in you. That's that thing. It's like, because people think that humans live longer now than we used to. And it's like, actual human life hasn't really been extended that much by medicine. You're less likely, but like, you know, we still had people back in like ancient times living to like 80 or 90 or whatever. Mm. The reason why like life expectancy has gone up is just because a lot less kids die of like easily preventable diseases. <laughs> Yep. You know, at least until the anti-vaxxers get their way. I mean, I think you'll find that George Soros and Bill Gates are trying to introduce a vaccine to microchip us all and then buy Microsoft Word Premium. I, I, I'm not quite sure I what guess, they... Yeah. Like, when it, when it, whenever they say, like, oh, yeah, it's to control people, what exactly, what level of control mm. do, do they think is going to happen that's not already exerted by having a smart device in your pocket at all times that knows what you're looking <laughs> at, for how long, where, and with whom? I can't remember. I sort of had a conversation with someone about George Soros because, like, apparently, like, one of the very offensive conspiracy theories about him is that, because obviously he's Jewish and stuff, and it's mm-hmm. like that he was actually a Nazi collaborator. He was 12 when, like, <laughs> I think when the war ended <laughs> or something or something like that. And it's like, I mean, that's a very young age to become a collaborator, I'd assume. Going back onto the topic of, like, the death of highwaymen. And all that. Obviously, the one you're talking about is in Wyoming. Mm-hmm. Uh, you know, the most famous highwayman in Britain is, uh, or was, Dick Turpin. Mm-hmm. I think he was, I don't know what years he was around. I think it was a bit earlier than the cowboy times, you know, like, cause that's like late 1800s, isn't it? So I think he was early. Born 1705, died 1739. Oh, well, there we go. So when he was, so, because if you go to York, you can see his grave and there's stuff about him in the uh, prison museum there. Mm-hmm. Which is where I learned all this stuff. He was, when he got captured and then was going to be, I think he was captured in a trap. I think, you know, like, because they knew he was robbing stagecoaches. So they set a fake one up full of guards and then, you know, arrested him. And he was sentenced to hanging. And what he did was he actually paid people to uh, mourn him. Like, when he was walking to the gallows, apparently he dressed up all in his best sauntered up to the gallows like with swag and stuff you know trying to look as nonchalant as possible and he'd already paid a bunch of like people in the crowd to just act incredibly distraught <laughs> so the people all like wailing and like crying and tearing their hair out and stuff to make it all very dramatic and then yeah then he got hung you gotta respect uh, the sort of showman even in your final yeah. seconds <laughs> exactly like showmanship to the end yeah, the only thing that let him down slightly is they decided to hang him in a bookshop and he, he got so relaxed, <laughs> he shot himself <laughs> on the gallows. Um, so yeah, so on that rather uh, morbid note, I will hand it over to you for your final topic. Okay, so for my second and final topic, I want to talk about, well, you know how much this show loves talking about pioneers, geniuses and other personalities from history who were just stand out. And so today I'd like to talk to you about an Indian maths genius called Shakuntala Devi, who was described as a human computer. So she born in 1910. Uh, I think, oh no, sorry, which one? <laughs> I can't do maths. <laughs> she was born in 19. <laughs> <laughs> she was born in uh, 1930 and then died in 2013. Actually, I don't think that's right. I think I've fucked up my math, which is just <laughs> wonderfully ironic. <laughs> but anyway, she, uh, yeah. No, no, no. Just let's, a, get, let, let's get it, let's get this straight. Right. She, she was born in 1930. She was, well, it doesn't have a birth date, but she died in 2013 and she was in her eighties. Just to give an idea of when she was, you know, when she was around, like we're talking 20th century for the most part. Okay. <laughs> 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 I should have done the maths beforehand. Anyway, unlike me, she you know the worst part is I'm an engineer, like I've done nothing but maths since like I was eighteen. Uh, <laughs> but I've just got progressively worse and worse at doing maths in my head because I've just got used to you know, first it's calculators <laughs> yeah. and now everything's just on like Excel or something. So the idea of like, use up all your brain <laughs> your brain power of learning German. Yeah. Anyway, so she was born in um you know, in the countryside, I think. Obviously, I don't really know my Indian geography, but basically, she wasn't in uh, the hustle and bustle or whatever. She uh, had to teach herself. So her father, 
realised that she was like a maths whiz when she was three years old and they were playing cards and he thought she was cheating. And it turns out she was basically counting cards. <laughs> like she was just managed to memorise all the cards that had, um, that had been drawn before so she knew whether or not he was bluffing and stuff. And at the age of six, she did a public performance in the city to basically uh, show off her math skills. She was able to teach herself reading and writing and then she'd do like impossible, well, obviously not impossible, but incredibly difficult, complex mental calculations like in front of people. All right. So someone would like come up and say, what's 351 times 4,071 and she'd just know it. Yeah, exactly. Yeah. So she was in the Guinness Book of Records for multiplying two 13 digit numbers together in front of an audience, and she was able to do it in 28 seconds. Fox Y even low-balled it with her. Yeah, <laughs> yeah, exactly. Yeah. Once, she was on a BBC show, and she, you know, they asked her the answer, and she gave it her. And then the guy was like, oh, no, you're wrong. It's, you know, I've got it written down here. It's whatever. It turns out that the uh, answer, she was right, <laughs> and that the BBC had fucked up their calculations. <laughs> they re-examined the numbers uh, she used to do things like compete against supercomputers, you know, to see who calculate things faster. She struggled with the fact, though, that she never really got to make that much money from it. You know, she had a career, ever, but, like, she never... And she was always frust- apparently frustrated from the fact that, you know, there's, like, you could add up all these numbers and multiply everything, but she wasn't really... You know, she didn't parlay it into a career as such, so she ended up becoming, like, an author instead. But yeah, it's just um, just blows my mind that somehow some people can be born with brains that just you know how like different people's brains can work so differently. Yeah, well, that, that was going to be me. Me question: What is it about her brain? Well, that, the, the what what is her brain doing differently? I think there's a little bit of research, but it was that thing you know where like they'd ask her how did you work this out, and she'd kind of just be like, you know, like I just know. You know that thing where like. Because I remember this at school when obviously it was like a lot simpler stuff like that. But you know when like teachers would ask you to like write out your work in and like sometimes they'd be like, I don't know what my working was. Like I just did it. It just makes sense. It just yeah. made sense and it came out. And they're like, no, you need to write your work in out. And they like teach you because obviously they try to teach you because when it gets harder, you have to be able to write it down. Otherwise you won't be able to work your way through it and stuff. Whereas obviously she's able to be doing these, oh, I just know it. <laughs> Things that nobody else can even question her about. Like... So it's like they were never really able to work out how a brain worked. Sort of if numbers are a language to you, you don't have to think of the the word in your native language. Mm. And it if numbers just I wonder if it worked in reverse, like if if uh, you gave her an impossibly long number, she could be like, "Oh, well that's these two numbers times together." Yeah, oh, yeah, she could do any like all sorts of it. Obviously people tended to focus on the multiply these things together because that's a sort of more impressive trick isn't it yeah but yeah no she she was like a maths ge- you know it wasn't just it's that thing because there's maths and there's maths if you know what i mean there's like arithmetic yeah, yeah and yeah. there's maths but i think by all accounts she was good at all of them do you think it was because of the time she was born that her talents probably wouldn't use their fullest cap- capabilities where if she had been born later in the 20th century and been around for the explosion of tech companies then there would be more opportunities for her as a young woman. Maybe. I did. Uh, it's like that film you've seen, Hidden Figures, about the uh, mm-hmm. black ladies at NASA. Like, back in, yeah. back in the day, before computers were any good, like, being good at calculating things in your head was a skill, and, the, you know, you'd have teams of people. So, you know, maybe in a way, she'd been... I think it's just, like, opportunity, I guess. Like, and knowing... You know, had she been somewhere... Like I would say, I think she was a bit out in back and beyond. That's why she had to teach herself stuff. Whereas if she'd been somewhere with, um, you know, she'd grown up somewhere where instead of at six years old, she was used for performing in front of people. It was like a teacher was just like, holy shit, you're really clever. Like, here's some books. You know, maybe yeah. things would have developed it. You know, because it basically was used as little more than like a performance trick. And apparently she was a bit frustrated by that because she wanted to do more and stuff. But yeah, it's the way things work out, isn't it? That's how I say she moved into writing and stuff instead. It just reminds me, there was that kid at our school, I think it was the year above, maybe the year above that. He was like a maths genius. 
not on this level, but I'm sure he represented like Britain in like is it like the Maths Olympiad or something? You know those. In fact, I'm sure he was on TV. I'm sure there was a TV about the British maths team or something. He was on it. Anyway, maths genius. And um, I remember sometimes kids would go up to him and just ask him to like multiply random people. Go up and be like, "What's four thousand and seventy-two times three hundred and sixteen? And he'd just be like, "You don't know the answer." Like, I could give you any number. Like, yeah. what are, you, are you going to disagree with me about it? Like, you don't know. Yeah. And then they'd it's always full. be like... <laughs> what do you want? Yeah, they'd always be like, oh, shit. <laughs> you know, because they'd always be like, oh, yeah, let's go, like, get the nerd to, like, say something. And then he'd just be like, y- y- you don't know. <laughs> and they're like, oh, shit, yeah. Good point, I guess. Yeah, well, next time we'll bring a calculator. <laughs> yeah, you do that, mate. But no, it's weird. It's like, also, have you seen that thing where people who can, like... See numbers as like colours and stuff like that. Like the brains just work differently and they just associate numbers with colours or sounds or whatever. There's a word for it, I can't remember what it is though, but you know, where you associate different sensory things together and they tend to be much better at memorising things and stuff because they've got like links in their brain. Yeah, I suppose it's just making more synapses, isn't it? It's making more connections. Yeah. Because, yeah, the same works with words. There are people who see not only letters of the alphabet, but words as particular colours, and then hmm. some colours go together and some don't. Or Brains are crazy. I, I watched a, a documentary the other day, or oh, uh, no, I'll come clean. I was at the gym and there was a, 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 a <laughs> programme on <laughs> and I was half paying attention to it, so it's perfect for an anecdote. You know, it was all about people who have, they get brain injuries and what like wake up from say comas or just they recover and they they have different personalities or completely different accents and there was one guy who was like a bricklayer and then he had an accident at work and he woke up and could play the piano beautifully mm. and now he's a concert pianist and it's just like the brains are mad yeah. that that information is just it's it's in there somewhere, yeah. and you can knock, knock your brain around, and it unlocks it. Just going back a bit to, you know, we were saying about how a woman grew up in um, the outskirts and stuff, so she wasn't, like, at the centre of learning. I was reading about a Russian physicist and engineer who, um, back in the uh, 19th century, who had also grew up in the middle of middle of nowhere, where there's no, like, university and stuff, so he's self-taught. He Well, he did learn a bit, because he lived in Moscow for a bit, but then he was, like moved back out to the sticks and he's doing all this work um, on equations on like I think it was on like fluid dynamics or something like that and he was really excited and he'd spent all this time writing it and then he showed it his friend because he was trying to work out how to get it published and his friend had to be like uh, they've already done this like 25 years ago <laughs> like oh. so after all that he was like he still ended up in the books and stuff because he did some other things but like yeah, imagine spending all that time and then somebody being like, yeah, no, they've, they've already done that. But he was hundreds and hundreds and hundreds of miles away from the nearest library or near, you know, at least the nearest library that would have that type of stuff in, university yeah, yeah. library or whatever. So he had no idea that <laughs> all the equations and stuff that he was working on had already been worked out. Yeah, it'd be like if I, I phoned you up all excitedly and be like, Chris, I've invented... A grill that drains the fat out of <laughs> out of food. Is that a lean green <laughs> lean green uh, grilling machine by any chance? And I'd be like, "What have you heard of it?" And like, you know, you've got to you know, let me down gently. I wouldn't let you down gently. I'd just show you the uh, video of George <laughs> Foreman knocking people out and be like, "This guy, this guy is your competition. <laughs> Are you sure you want to go up against him?" <laughs> I always wondered at what point in his career he thought of the the George Foreman grill. Uh, I like, suspect that he didn't think of it and somebody else slapped his name on it. Oh, see, I thought it was more like he, he got hit in the head and he's lying on the canvas. <laughs> and it ca- came to him in a vision. <laughs> like, that's it. Grilled meat. Eureka. And ten. Oh, fuck. Oh, unless, like, he, maybe he was, like, leaning against the ropes and he like, just had an idea and was like, hang on a second. If you put meat like this, all the fat would drain <laughs> off it. <laughs> Eureka moment. Eighth wonder of the world. He must have spent so much time perfecting his craft to be one of the greatest boxers of all time. And then he's just ended up being way more, like, probably way more well known, like, around the world. And, like, definitely made way more money. Like, just, like, fronting, like, just being a grill salesman. <laughs> like, you know, but like, like you say, life works in mysterious ways. Nah, indeed it does. 
And with that, I have exhausted all my knowledge of, well, the articles that I've read today. So that's the end of the show. Thank you very much for listening. As always, it's been a pleasure. Is there anything you'd like to add, Chris? No. Okay, well, that was short and sweet. We're now going to go and get in our tour bus, having eaten all the brown M&Ms, do some mental arithmetic badly, because, you know, probably read a book and have a poo. <laughs> Separate tour buses, I hope. <laughs> oh, yeah, yeah, of course, because that's part of our ride, it wasn't. And also, you can't shit on tour buses. You've got to... It's number one only. Oh, well, good to know, I guess. Um... I, just, I don't have anything to add to that. No, no those are our plans. Do yeah. what you want with them. Um, <laughs> and yeah, so I guess there's nothing else to say but Auf Wiedersehen. Auf Wiedersehen. Dankeschön. Uh, yeah. You're gonna, you can follow us on Twitter. Are you going to mention Oh, that? yeah. Yeah, sorry. Of course, yeah. So if you... Uh, yeah, if you've enjoyed the show, <laughs> we're very well rehearsed. We're rusty as hell. <laughs> yeah, it feels like it's been a long time since we've recorded this. Yeah. I oh, know. It's every all the schedules and everything have just been up in the air. It's been a weird year, I'm sure everyone. I mean, I don't want to mention the the event or whatever that's going on, but <laughs> the, the calamity, much. yeah, the calamity. But you know, I think we can all agree that this has been a very, very unusual year, and I've just lost all track of time. And yeah, if you've enjoyed the show and you want to keep in touch with us, then please follow us on Twitter at Cooking with Grief, no G on cooking. Um, or email us at cookingwithgrief at gmail.com and also please if whether or not you like the show please leave us a review on iTunes or wherever you download your podcasts because that really helps the show to grow so with that it's goodbye from me and it's goodbye from me alright I'll feed the same I'll feed the same again bye goodbye have uh I don't know. I don't know what to wish people these days. Just keep, Just, keep, yeah. keep, keep, keep on keeping on. It's like we said um, off air before we started recording. You know, like twenty twenty <laughs> has been the death of small talk because it's like, oh, well, yeah, what have you been up to recently? Literally nothing. <laughs> Absolutely nope. fucking nothing. Going on a holiday? Nope. nope. No one is. All oh, right. Okay. Yeah. Uh, there, been, been, been anywhere? Been anywhere? Nice. Nope. 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 Gone for any nice meals? Any nice restaurants? Nope. Watched any nope. good films? Like in the summer? Nope. Nope. Any cool concerts you've been to? Nope. Did you watch the uh, the the sport? Nope. Nope. It's just. I mean, it's a good time for books, I guess. Although not bookshops. Yeah. Speaking of which, I need to use the loop. So we'll <laughs> leave it there. <laughs> Thank <laughs> you.